We've been talking about social capital and how to build it in organizations. Now I want to think about a different problem, which is that it is something that involves norms in a very crucial way. And so it is something that ought to be studied in the context of ethics. Now, why do I say that? Well, because what builds social capital, what social capital is actually, are the norms and networks of reciprocity, of cooperation, of trust that help people accomplish things together. And once we focused on that and realized, wait, these are norms we're talking about, norms of cooperation, of reciprocity, of trust, we start realizing that the way people behave in groups is something that contributes to or detracts from social capital, or perhaps is simply irrelevant to it, but there is an important character to the norms that are associated with successful social groups. Presumably, I as an individual, somebody who is part of all sorts of social groups, whether I like it or not, have the obligation to contribute in positive ways to those groups. And to the extent that I'm responsible for forming and maintaining groups, I want to do that in a way that those groups enhance their capacities, not only for survival, but their capacity to thrive, their capacity to accomplish the goals they've set for themselves. So the norms of reciprocity and cooperation that are involved in social capital are important ethical norms in their own right and deserve some study. So I want to talk a bit about those norms and see how social capital helps us to solve certain problems that arise in game theory, why they're important therefore to groups, but also important norms for individuals. There is a problem in particular that every social group faces, a problem of getting people to be good team players, to focus on the welfare of the group and one another's welfare rather than simply their own welfare. And so I want to remind you of a couple of situations in game theory that will make clear what I have in mind. Let's take a look first at the prisoner's dilemma. In a prisoner's dilemma type situation, we've got two people and the situation is symmetric for the two of them, typically, although it doesn't really have to be exactly. But the idea is that each player has two choices, to cooperate or to defect. So in the actual original prisoner's dilemma case, the prisoners can cooperate with one another and remain silent, or they can give testimony against one another and cooperate with the police, but defect with respect to one another. Now, if I am one of those prisoners, my first choice is for me to defect and you to cooperate. Of course, you do worse than that. I end up cooperating with the police and testifying against you. You get clobbered, and so I get off scot-free. So my first choice is to do that. Of course, for you, it's just the opposite. If you defect and I cooperate, you do great and I do terribly. If we both cooperate, well, we're both convicted only of some minor charge, we get off easy. And so that's our second choice. If we testify against one another, however, then there's a lot more evidence we're convicted of a more serious crime. We go to jail for longer. If we think about each player's strategy, then we can see that I don't know what you're going to do, but if you cooperate, well, if I cooperate, I get my second choice. If I defect, I get my first choice. So my best response to your cooperating is to defect. Suppose, on the other hand, you're going to defect. Well, if I cooperate, then I get clobbered with a heavy sentence, and so that's my last choice. If I defect, then hey, I get a slightly better choice, my third choice, so I better defect. So my best response is to defect. Now notice in this situation then, my best response, no matter what you do, is to defect. So defecting becomes my dominant strategy. Of course, you look at things the same way. You don't know what I'm going to do. So if I'm going to cooperate, you say, well, then I've got a choice between my second and first choice. If I defect, I do better. So I have a best response of defecting. What if I defect? Well, then you think, oh, if I cooperate, I'm really in trouble. I also better defect. That's my best response. So you also have a best response of defecting, no matter what I do. Consequently, we get one Nash equilibrium. And that Nash equilibrium is one that is clearly inferior for each one of us. 
than if we had both cooperated. So ironically, I have a preference for this and this. <laughs> you have a preference for this and this. And that leads us to a situation where uh, we clearly could have done better. It leads us to a suboptimal and inadequate equilibrium. Well, how could we have defeated that? How could we stop that outcome from occurring? Answer is, we could have cooperated with one another. If there were strong enough norms of cooperation, of trust, I would have trusted that you wouldn't rat me out to the police, and you would be able to trust me that I wouldn't rat you out to the police. So I would be trusting, and I would be trustworthy, and we could have achieved this outcome. But instead, if we don't have that norm of trust, and those norms of reciprocity and cooperation, we fall into the trap, and we end up with a Nash equilibrium that's clearly suboptimal. How then do we achieve the better outcome? We develop those norms of trust, of cooperation. And that turns out to be absolutely critical to resolving the prisoner's dilemma. Now, of course, it still is to my advantage in a way to cheat. You say, okay, I'm gonna obey this. I'm gonna be trustworthy. I'm going to cooperate. And I said, <laughs> I'm going to defect. I get a better outcome, but you get into trouble. That's why reciprocity is so important. Because if this is happening just once, you might think, well, no matter how strong the norm is, better be really strong, stronger than that temptation to gain an advantage for myself at your expense. However, if we interact frequently, well, then we're going to be in such situations frequently and a norm of reciprocity. Hey, you did that to me. I'm going to do that to you. But also, if you turn out to be trustworthy in this interaction, I'll trust you again. And you can trust me. And in general, then social capital turns out to be crucial here. Now, in two ways. One, in steering us toward cooperative behaviors that produce a better outcome, and so enabling us to enjoy the fruits of cooperation. But also, in providing a community within which there is frequent enough interaction that we've had a chance to reciprocate for one another to build up those norms of cooperation and trust. Consequently, in a group with strong social capital, we are typically going to end up in the better outcome here. People are not going to play their dominant strategy, which looks like the rational thing for a self-interested person to do, they're instead going to put the interests of other people and of the group ahead of their own interests in these cases. And surprise, surprise, when they do that, they actually end up with a better outcome for themselves as well as for the group and for other people. So it turns out to be really important for the success of the group and the success of the individual people within the group that people have those norms of reciprocity, of trust, of cooperation. The same thing applies to stag hunt situations. We've talked about those. In a stag hunt, we similarly have options, each of us, to cooperate and help hunt the stag, which takes a number of us cooperating, or we can each defect and simply go after a rabbit on our own. Well, my first choice is that we work together to get the stag. If I am cooperating, trying to hunt the stag, and you go off and chase a rabbit, well then, I'm going hungry. I'm not going to get anything. You get your second choice. Not as good as having a share of the stag, but on the other hand, you get something at least. You catch the rabbit. But suppose I defect. Suppose I just go off and chase a rabbit. Well, if you stand there hunting the stag, you get the worst possible outcome because you get no food at all. I at least get the rabbit. What if we both defect? We both just go off hunting rabbits. Well, there aren't that many rabbits. We're now competing with one another for rabbits. So our chances of getting a rabbit go somewhat down, still better than having no chance of food at all, but still not quite as good as being the only one out there hunting the rabbit. So that becomes our third choice. If we analyze this in game theoretic terms, we can say, okay, I don't know what you're going to do. You're going to be off in the distance. I can't see you. But if you cooperate and hunt the stag with me, well, then I get my first choice. If I also hunt the stag, I get my second choice if I defect. So my best response to your cooperation is also to cooperate. That gives me my first choice, yummy stag. If, on the other hand, you're going to defect, then I think, well, if I cooperate, then I'm in real trouble. You've gone off somewhere. I'm relying on your help to get the stag. I'm going to go hungry. 
But if I defect as well and chase a rabbit, well then I at least have a chance at getting a rabbit. So my best response to your defection is also to defect. Of course, you think of it the same way. If I cooperate, your best response is also to cooperate, get your share of the stag. But if I defect, your best response is to defect. So in this case, we have two Nash equilibria. Neither of us has a dominant strategy, and there are two things that will end up leading us to an equilibrium situation. We both have rabbit, or we both have stag. Now, we're clearly better off, each of us, as well as the group, is better off if we hunt the stag. But it's easy for us, if we do not trust the other person, to end up in the suboptimal equilibrium. So how do we avoid getting trapped in this inadequate equilibrium and achieve the better, the optimal equilibrium? It's a matter, again, of social capital, of norms, of trust, of reciprocity, of cooperation. If we have a norm of cooperation between us, we will both stay there and hunt the stag because we trust one another and we'll get our best outcome. But what happens if we don't trust one another? If we don't have that norm of reciprocity and of cooperation, then we each just go off chasing our own rabbit and we end up with our third choice instead of our first choice. Clearly worse, not only for the group, but for both of us. It is worse for each one of us. I could have had my first choice instead of my third choice. But of course, only if you cooperated too. That's why I have to trust you. I have to rely on social capital. If the social capital is present, we can get the better equilibrium. And so in both cases, you might say, whether it's an equilibrium or not, we can get the better outcome, the better outcome for the group and better outcome for each member of the group if we trust one another, if we cooperate. So social capital turns out to be critical for solving those problems and leading the group and the individuals within the group to the better outcome. Any group, then, is going to face the problem of how to get people to stop looking out merely for their own self-interest and start looking toward the interest of the group as a whole and looking to contribute to the group as a whole. And now we can see the importance of cooperation, of trust, of those norms that constitute social capital to solving those problems. Because insofar, as in both cases, I trust the other person and I work for the good of the combination, the group, instead of merely my own good, here playing my dominant strategy, or here figuring, well, gosh, I don't know what you're going to do, so the safest thing is for me to defect. That way, at least I get some chance at some food and I don't go hungry. If I focus merely on my own welfare, I may well end up here or here. If I focus on the welfare of the group, on the other hand, I should end up here or here. And so I want to do that. It's going to be crucial for the group and for me that in the end, I am able to trust other people, that those norms of cooperation and reciprocity exist. In a prisoner's dilemma situation, saying, yeah, I know this is my dominant strategy to defect. I know that no matter what you do, I'm better off defecting. But I also know that if all of us go in approaching it with that attitude, we end up with a suboptimal equilibrium. We could have done better, better if we had not played our dominant strategy, if we had done what, from a selfish point of view, looks irrational, and instead put the success of the group and cared about other people within the group. If only I had valued the group and the other person involved in this prisoner's dilemma with me, we could have ended up in a better outcome. Of course, if that person did too. And the same thing with the stag hunt. If I don't trust the other people around me to cooperate, if I think they're purely self-interested, we may well end up here. But if we value the success of the group and value one another enough, then we'll look at a situation like this and say, well, yeah, if you cooperate and I defect, I get my second choice, but you could really get screwed. I don't want that to happen. And so, I've got to care about you and care that you don't suffer that worst outcome. And similarly here, I've got to say, oh, but then you're in real trouble. I can't do that to you. So ethical norms become critical here. This is why social capital is crucial to the success of groups, both in these types of situations, leading them to better outcomes than the suboptimal equilibrium that a group with lower social capital is going to end up in. And that's what happens here and here. 
there's actually a big benefit to each participant, not just to the totality of the group. So there is a solution to these problems, but it relies on norms of trust, on norms of cooperation, on a sense of responsibility to one another and to the group. Consequently, those kinds of norms, norms of reciprocity, of cooperation, of trust, are vital. Recently, I met with a group of high school students who were interested in philosophy. We were supposed to talk for about an hour. We ended up talking for more than two and a half hours together. And at some point in the conversation, someone asked me, what do you think the most important virtue is? I thought a moment and answered, I think being nice. <laughs> that sounds lame from the point of view of ancient philosophy or even early modern philosophy, but I think from the point of view of game theory and thinking about social capital, it's absolutely crucial. Trustworthiness might be a close second. And why? Well, because someone who is nice in that game theoretic sense is cooperative. They're not going to lead off by defecting. They're going to cooperate with you and trust that you are going to cooperate with them. So a nice person is cooperative. They are going to expect you to be trustworthy and they are going to be trusting. Those are vital for interactions with people in groups. So in general, in social interactions, the people who are nice in that sense, who lead with cooperation, who cooperate until given some reason not to, those are the people who are going to contribute to the organization's success. Why? Because they're going to cooperate. They're going to trust you to cooperate. They're going to help to build social capital. They are going to lead us from equilibria like this to outcomes like that. From an equilibrium like this to an optimal equilibrium here. From this perspective, then, being nice is actually a crucial virtue. It's being cooperative. It's being trusting. It's being the kind of person who contributes to social capital, not just of the organization you work for, but of every group of people you're a part of. So, in conclusion, social capital is important. It leads us to better outcomes. How do you actually contribute to social capital? Be nice.